Football is back, y'all. Something you absolutely love to see. Let's jump in. The revamped passing core and seemingly healthy Jameis Winston and the Saints travel to Atlanta to take on Marcus Mariota and the Falcons. What do we like on the Falcons' side of the ball, Jake? I mean, it's pretty clear to me. You just got to start Kyle Pitts if you have him, especially with Drake London missing a little time, being questionable, uh, logging limited practices, uh, you know, a crowded running back room. Nobody really knows who's going to be the guy there. So just put Kyle Pitts in your lineup. Don't worry about it. You drafted him in the third round. You're starting him. Saints side of the ball. I look for the Saints to come out the gate passing. I really believe that the Saints uh, have a shot to come out the gate and control this game just because, you know, not to speak on how good I think the Saints are going to be, more so to speak on how bad I think the Falcons are going to be. And the Saints, I think, are at least a tier or two above this team. Uh, I feel like it's not talked about enough, but the Saints arguably improved their wide receiver core the most of any team this season. MT's back healthy. They got first round pick in Alave, some people's favorite wide receiver of this class. I mean, Jarvis Landry, it, it, you know, is a shell of himself, but as a wide receiver three comes on a team, I mean, Jarvis Landry is a great wide receiver three to have 100%. on your team. So I think, um, in the end of the day, I like this passing attack. I think they lean towards the passing attack, particularly in this game, just to get control of it. I think they passed more than we think is what I'm really getting to. But that said, MT is starting to put MT in there. But I'm actually here for starting a Lave if you want. Um, maybe in a little bit more of a deeper leagues, 12-man, 14-man league. But I do think a Lave in this situation where I think he really fits Jameis as far as moving that ball down the field, we should have some thought into you know playing a Lave at least as a top 40, top 36 option. I would agree. All right, folks. Like we're back. This is Crushing the Competition. We, this was the preview last year. We are rebranded. We are Crushing the Competition. We are previewing the week one or whatever week is coming up, giving you game-by-game game actionable advice for every single game on the slate. I am Tyler. He is Jake. We are stoked to be back. Jake, before we jump in here, man, um, most looking forward to week one. Go. Um, Football being back. But I'd love to hear it. <laughs> besides that, I don't know. I think the game that I'm most excited to see is our is our Thursday night game. You know, getting to see you know the Super Bowl champions playing the uh, the Bills. I I don't think you could ask for a better game. But besides that, I want to see. I would really love to see the Bears get a win week one. I'm just going to be we'll honest about it. I that. would love we'll, to see it. We we will we will get into that, folks. Week one, crush the competition. Here's Lamar on a run. The Browns traveled to Carolina to take on the Panthers, and the Browns' much estranged quarterback Baker Mayfield should be a good one, at least from a narrative-driven point. It is a 42-point implied total, so we are saying there's not going to be, or Vegas is saying at least, that there's not going to be a lot of points in this, not expecting a lot of offense, but you got the Carolina side of the ball. What do you got? Yeah, I think with Carolina, it's pretty clear. Like you could start DJ Moore if you have him. You can start Christian McCaffrey if, if you have him. But I think the sneaky play there is actually starting the Carolina defense as a streamer in your league. You're getting a Browns offense that's projected to be really not great to start the season. Let's be honest here. Their their wide receiver one is Amari Cooper, who you know typically is pretty solid wide receiver, but not a superstar. Past that, you have a lot of questions. David Njoku's got a ton of questions. Obviously, Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt, they're fine. But Jacoby Brissett is the quarterback there. He's not super inspiring for a lot of people. So I'm comfortable streaming Carolina's defense this week against what I project to be a pretty bad Browns offense. Most likely. With that said, the Browns, it does appear to be a bit of a mismatch with the Browns run offense versus the Panthers run defense. Looking for the Browns. I expect the Browns run game to be the preferred approach of the offense for at least the first 11 weeks here. Um, you know, if not the run, then short area passing to the game. Obviously, like you said, Chubb is a no-brainer here. I think he's kind of being overlooked a bit in all of this offseason fun, easily top 10. This is a top eight play even for me this week. But more of the take here goes to David Joku. He, he's likely my favorite non-RB player um, to start on this offense. 
Um, a lot has to do with just the signals uh, all off season, the contract, what's been said, are really pointing in the direction of Njoku taking a larger role on this Browns offense. So I think there is some streaming appeal here. Um, you know, there is an opportunity to somewhat break out. Uh, I'm not saying Njoku is going to be elite, but I mean, top eight, top 10, I certainly think it's in the range of outcomes for Njoku if things, you know, continue to move as, as the words and uh, the drum beats, as, as, as they say it, uh, are going in his direction. So he's only actually rostered in 45% of ESPN leagues right now. So I think he at least warrants a bench spot if you don't have an elite tight end right now, because Njoku could be that guy that you ride as, you know, a top 10 guy for the rest of the season if, you know, we get through week one and it's pretty clear that they're really only throwing the ball to, you know, likely Amari Cooper, Joku, and maybe some other ancillary guy. 49ers and your hapless Bears. Your Bears. What are we expecting here? What are we optimistic about? Uh, we're optimistic about Darnell Mooney, and and that's just about it. You know, this week one matchup, it, it could not be any worse for the Bears getting a team that's been really good against kind of their strengths. You know, San Francisco has been a very solid defense for, for quite some time now, and I don't project that to be any different, especially with the rain that is projected for this game. Um, it looks like it's going to storm all weekend here in Chicago. So we're really looking at, you know, just a questionable game. If you have Darnell Mooney, I'm fine plugging him into – you know, your, your flex spot. I would not feel super great if he was like my wide receiver one or two this week. Um, but you know, the San Francisco team last year was also really, really solid, like arguably a top five or six defense against the tight end, which brings a lot of questions for commit. This offensive line isn't good. You're going to have a rookie going against Nick Bosa all day. So really Mooney is probably the only bear I'm comfortable starting this week. David Montgomery as like an RB2, I guess, kind of works his way in there as well. But I'd really much prefer if I had other options than the Chicago offense this week. 49ers, in my opinion, um, you know, there's a lot of ways that I see them kind of rolling here. I didn't even notice the rain thing, but I think that still lends itself well to how I think this game goes. Like, regardless if Lance's arm is there or not, uh, their run game should be able to to put this game away for the 49ers. Um, you're likely starting Elijah Mitchell anyways, but I think he has an actual shot at cracking the top 12, yeah, top 15 this week. And then, uh, you know, TDP be damned here. I'm, I'm not too sure he's the answer. Um, big on Elijah uh, Mitchell this year. But also monitor Kittle, Kittle's groin injury. Last time I checked, mm -hmm. it was still up in the air. Uh, yeah. If Kittle, for some reason, is not able to go, that does make Brandon Ayuk a bit more interesting. Like right now, Ayuk yeah. is a great bench player. Uh, don't really see him cracking my lineup this week. Um, but if Kittle does sit, you know, I do, do think that opens up a decent amount of volume to where Ayuk can be a top 36 option for me this week. Yeah, I wouldn't mind plugging any of the any of the, you know, I say any, if plugging Debo or Ayuk into my lineup, you know, especially against this Bears team, like they've got one really good corner. Everything else is a bunch of questions, as I think any Bears fan should be admitting at this point in the year. Steelers, Bengals, Bengals side of the ball. Uh, if they're healthy, start up. I mean, let's be honest here. It's Joe Burrow. It's Joe Mixon. It's Jamar Chase. It's T Higgins. You know, Hayden Hurst even, I think, is a, a fine streaming option this week if you need him. You know, this is a high volume team or a high value team. A lot of guys are going to get a lot of valuable touches. I'm even comfortable starting both Higgins and chase. If I have both of them in a league, like that's how good this wide receiver team is, or these wide receiver core is just as, as a whole, you know, I, I don't anticipate too many problems um, starting any of these guys, especially week one week one, we tend to see some higher scoring matchups. Um, so I, I'm fully comfortable just throwing the starters for the Bengals out there. Steelers, you know, aren't given much of a shot here as they're almost touchdown dogs. Uh, that should come as no surprise to most people considering what the Bengals did last year, um, you know, which is just not surprising. Right. Um, but, you know, when you look at the retirement of Big Ben, they lost their longtime QB and honestly their offensive coordinator when he retired. So, like, there's just so much in question here. You know, what does an actual Matt Canada-led offense look like uh, with Mitch Trubisky, nonetheless? <laughs> Um, you know, the range of outcomes here is pretty wide. If you ask me in terms of like, are they run heavy pass heavy? How do they attack this game? Is it a lot of Najee? Um, does Frymouth get involved? Um, you know, my take here is at the end of the game, I think people realize they may have faded uh, Claypool a bit too hard this off season uh, and realize that he might actually be the second option there along with Deontay where he finds himself, uh, you know, fantasy contributor and fantasy relevant more oftentimes than not. Yeah. Eagles. Oh, you got you got something on the Claypool? 
No, yeah, I love Chase Claypool. I think he's overhated, and I think you know the potential. As, as much as I like George Pickens, we know that historically rookie wide receivers take a little bit of time to get going. You know, it's not often guys come out and have these just Justin Jefferson years as a rookie, but even then, he took until week four to really break out. So I'm fully comfortable getting Claypool into my lineups to start the year. Eagles travel to Detroit to take on the Lions, fresh off of Hard Knocks. I think Hard Knocks created a lot of uh, Lions fans across the country this summer, at least a lot of people rooting for them. Jake, are those newly found Lions uh, diehards going to be disappointed against the Eagles? I, I think they are going to lose. Um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna put that out there. I know that may hurt to hear, Tyler, but the this is an Eagles team that is beatable. Uh, at least last year was very beatable against one position, and that's the tight ends. If you have TJ Hawkinson, I've even seen some leagues where Hawkinson almost went undrafted or has been dropped for for some these running backs that you know maybe have a potential in their offense. Fire up Hawk with confidence this week. Fire up DeAndre Swift with confidence this week. Where I get a little bit nervous is with the wide receivers just because there's a lot again it's a lot of new talent in the room a lot of talent that's being added to the room does Amon Ross St. Brown continue his dominance from last year or from the end of last year what kind of role does GJ Chark have does Josh Reynolds have a role we, there's a lot of question marks in the wide receiver room but we know this Eagles team is beatable by the running backs specifically running backs who catch passes and especially against the tight ends I'm fully confident lighten up Hawk and Swift this week well, my heart of hearts wants the lines of defense to take a step forward this year. My brain knows that it's simply smart to bet against them. Uh, there are a lot of questions about how the Eagles will operate on offense. Are they going to commit to the run like we saw last year? Or is adding um, AJB um, going to make them pass a bit more? Yeah. Either way, I, th I think Hertz goes ballistic in this one, whether it be him on the ground uh, or through the air. But the Lions' run defense has been awful for a while. And even if they improve, it's still a, a good a good matchup for the elite uh, Eagles offensive line and the run attack. I've been above consensus all offseason on Miles Sanders. Not that it takes a lot to do that. I mean, people have him outside of their top 30 in a lot of places. But, you know, I think my, uh, you know, my fire, my passion for Miles Sanders, one of my most highly rostered players and redraft at this point, mind you, I took him in the eighth and the ninth. Uh, that, that, that momentum is going to continue into week one here. I got Miles Sanders as a top 24 running back and I'm starting him. I like it. I like the confidence on Sanders. I've, I was a, I was what you are this year, last year. I was the guy who kept taking Sanders because he kept falling, kept falling, kept falling. It bit me a little bit, but I do think that the offense is going to be a lot more open to having him involved this year. And in my opinion, he's the clear most talented running back in that room. So Never giving up. I will give up next year, but I, I feel like I've been in him since he's a rookie. For this cheap, if I were to get out now, it would just absolutely be devastating. If yeah. he blows up. So I'm here. Colton's. Colts, Texans, Texans, thoughts, Jake. I think really the only Texans player you can start with any form of confidence is Brandon Cooks. David Davis Mills, you know, he's a second year quarterback, he showed some okay things, showed some not great things last year. I'm not starting him. Even in a super flex league, I would much prefer to be starting somebody else as my QB2, especially against a Colts defense that, when healthy, can be one of the better defenses in football. But also, there's a lot of Damian Pierce hype. I'm not starting uh, that running, I'm not starting him, period but especially not against a Colts team that, that's got, you know, really good defense. Historically, he's a rookie. He doesn't catch a lot of passes. Just too many question marks there for me. Same with the tight ends. Brevin Jordan's not listed as the starter. I'm not starting Farrell Brown in my tight end, no matter how desperate I get. And, and just Brevin Jordan, I think him being listed as the backup right now is at least a, enough of a concern to get him completely out of, you know, streaming potential for me this week. Uh, Nico Collins as well, a wide receiver I've never been high on. Market's always going to be higher than him on me. I guess if you're super desperate in a really, really deep league where you have like five flex spots or something crazy like that, I guess maybe, but I'd much rather just start pretty much anybody else. But Brandon Cooks, he's perpetually undervalued. You probably got him for a steal in your draft for him to just go and put up solid mid to mid to low wide receiver two numbers. Throw him in the flex spot and you'll be completely okay this week. Colts. It's really just JT and Pittman here for me. Nothing too crazy. I suppose in two QB leagues, it can be firing up Matt Ryan, but that's about it. I think watching Naheem Hines, uh, his use here is going to be the most interesting to me. There's been a lot of conversation within the Colts, outside of the Colts, about how they want to get Hines more involved. I mean, I think, in fact, their head coach said that they plan to get Neem Hines more involved. Tough to believe because it certainly wasn't that way last year. Um, something to monitor, something I'll be monitoring, um, you know, especially if the Colts, like, grab this game early. So this is what I'm looking for. If the Colts grab this game early 
and we still see some Hines, I think it could point to a larger role in the passing game uh, for Hines going forward. A lot of people say, well, we didn't see Hines at all last year, right? Well, if you look at it, like the Colts weren't behind in many games at all last season. Like it, it was pretty much an outlier season in terms of statistically being ahead in games. So maybe that's why we didn't see Hines. Maybe it wasn't a decision and they wanted to feature Hines in 2021, but they just like never found themselves behind. So they didn't need to play him. I don't know. Making up a lot of reasons here, some excuses, I guess, but I'm really just keeping an eye on it. He minds to see if he does find his way on the field, because if I think the Colts ever do find themselves down, um, you know, there could be a world where Hines finds himself into some type of flex value if he's carved out a role. Still not worried about JT. JT's elite. You're never good. As long as he's on the field, you're not going to regret yeah. it. But just talking about more of an ancillary piece here. Yeah, I agree. Hines' usage this week uh, and throughout the early half of the season, anyway, is one of the things that I'm definitely very heavily watching just because he's he's a, you know, what do they call it? Like a post hype sleeper. Like he had, he had his peak. You know, we've been disappointed, at least in the past, by him as well, though. But there's so much talk, especially from the head coach, that's got to mean something. So it will be very interesting to see how he's used. Yeah, him, him and Claypool, both great post-type sleepers here. Pats at Dolphins. A lot of Dolphins questions that can be closer to that can be closer to being answered uh, versus its division rival here. Fins hit me. Yeah, I think the Dolphins, at least the most interesting thing for me this week is how the running back room is going to be. You know, everybody basically besides Raheem Mostert logged only a limited practice. You know, Chase Edmonds has come up with a groin injury. Gaskins has a neck injury. Ahmed has a heel injury. Raheem Mostert may start sneaking into to flex opportunity here. You know, this is a... a Patriots team that I think is really beatable. I don't think it's it's definitely not the Patriots of the past with, you know, Brady and super stout defenses, especially losing, you know, arguably their best defensive player to free agency last year, um, you know, not bringing him back. It, I'm, you know, I'm pretty comfortable with uh, Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle if he plays, obviously. I'm plugging him in the lineup here. Um, one player that's completely off my board for this week, though, is Mike Gesicki. This is a Patriots team that knows how to scheme out tight ends. And even though Gesicki is used more as a wide receiver, if Hill, Waddle, and Gesicki are all trying to play wide receiver at the same time, someone's going to suffer, and I have a real feeling it's going to be Gesicki. So even though you know you maybe snagged him later on in drafts, his ADP has been falling, I'd be looking somewhere else, um, if Waddle plays anyway, looking somewhere else for Gesicki's you know, range of outcomes. You know, I'd be comfortable with like a Gerald Everett or somebody else in, in the streaming contention there as opposed to Gasicki. And Joku. Yeah, definitely. He's he's a guy, you know, I even though I am telling you to start Carolina's defense this week as a streamer, like I, I I'm fully comfortable playing in Joku over Gasicki this week. Patriots, you know, if, if Matt Patricia really is calling the plays, like just light it all on fire. Maybe that's the salty Lions fan in me, but I also feel like there's some merit to that as well. If Matt Patricia is calling the place here, which it's been alluded to. I, I I didn't find anything that said it's been like official official. But yeah, isn't it like him and Judge splitting it, yeah. which is like worst possible scenario yeah. for everyone <laughs> I mean, involved? Oh God. Like it's laughable. It's a freaking joke. But anyways, I, I would have like if Patricia's involved in offensive play calling, I have serious concerns about this entire unit for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, if Mac Jones is your QB for some reason, I would be on my toes, ready to adjust if, if he is. Um, the wide receiver room is, is kind of gross for fantasy right now, um, but it is worth keeping an eye on. So I think the big thing here is we know this offense can still produce a top 30 wide receiver, albeit a boring one. Jacoby Myers probably has the best shot at that, but still I'm watching the snap counts. I'm watching the targets because um, there could be another guy that does emerge. I know Ty Taekwon Thornton's out. He could come in. It's just I think it's a very volatile wide receiver room, and it's worth monitoring to see where Daniel Jones you know, is throwing the ball, who's getting the snaps, who's getting the nod from the coaches, so on and so forth. Yeah, I agree. It, and there's just some concern, con, concerning things about that team, like seeing Ramondre and Harris both listed as co-starters. You know, they have two tight ends that they really like in Jonu and Henry. Like, there's just so many question marks that it's hard to be overly confident about anybody in that offense at this point. I almost read it again. Woo. Little, little, little uh, sloppy here. It's a one week back here. I feel like I've been slurring a couple words, but hey, let's lock it in. Let's lock it in. Knock off the rust. Here we go. Ravens and Jets, Flacco led Jets. Not exciting, but what do you got? Just start Elijah Moore and like pretty much avoid everybody else. I mean, we can we can talk all we want about Garrett Wilson coming in. Yes, he's a first round pick, but he's probably going to be playing to the outside. Elijah Moore played one game last year with Joe Flacco as a starter. He went eight receptions, 141 yards, and a touchdown. Yes, super small sample size. Yes, not a great thing if Joe Flacco's starting for your team in 2022, but we've got what we've got. 
fire up Elijah Moore, sit pretty much everybody else. Ravens, J.K. Dobbins is still in question. I feel like it's been like this mystery all offseason. Um, Rappaport goes on Twitter, says he's going to miss time. J.K. Dobbins fires back, says he's going to be healthy. Reports are good, positive about J.K. Dobbins being healthy. And then I think Lamar Jackson had something slip recently about, you know, it's yep. working his way back. He should be back in a couple weeks or alluded to it being a couple yep. weeks. So I don't really know what to, to think here. I, I can't believe I'm honestly about to say this, Jake, but – if JK can't go, Mike Davis might actually have a real shot to be fantasy relevant this week. Um, you know, he's been the running back that's been with running with the ones all summer long. Yep. Do I think Kenyon Drake is probably better at this point in his career than yeah. Mike Davis? Absolutely. But week one, I mean, Kenyon Drake just got signed. I think Mike Davis has actually flex appeal this week if you're in a bit of a pinch. Um, I don't know if I have the stones to put him in the top 36, but he could find himself there if J.K. actually is declared out. So while Lamar can obviously get his on the ground, this is the Jets. I expect the Ravens to win this game. They're going to run the ball. They want to run the ball. Mike Davis has appeal. <laughs> People forget that in 2020, the Carolina Panthers were undefeated when Mike Davis touched the ball more than 20 times. I'm just saying. <laughs> That's, I'm that's just hashtag ana analysis right there. Hashtag analysis. Hashtag analysis. Correlation, no. causation. We don't know if it matters, but it when, it com when it comes to those quads, it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> Jags and Commanders. Um, let's just say both teams stand to improve uh, from their 2021 performances. Commander side of the ball, your thoughts? With Terry, we ride. I mean, let's be real here. He's he's the guy that's there that we know what we're getting when we put him into the lineup. Logan Thomas, I think, just logged a limited practice, so we don't know what's coming out of the tight end position. That running back room is a mess. Brian Robinson, unfortunately, obviously, with his situation, he's not going to be active. J.D. McKissick, does he? what kind of role does he play? Does he stay in just the pass-catching role? Does he get more of that short yardage work? Gibby, what, what kind of role does he get plugged in? I think there's just too many question marks there for me to confidently start any of them. And with Jahan Dotson being a rookie, as we go back to kind of that same situation we talked about earlier where rookies may take a little bit of time to get going here, Terry's really the only one that I'm starting with confidence. And I think Carson Wentz also is a startable startable quarterback this week if like you were talking about where if mac is your quarterback if your option is starting mac mac jones or carson wentz i'm probably going to lean carson wentz honestly i don't have to call jags much like the pats i'm monitoring the use of the wide receivers and running backs in this case i mean etienne has been um twitter and most analysts is uh you know fanboy for most of the offseason here in the summer i've been a bit lower on him but i, I see the upside i can't deny that it exists but then uh this freak of nature, James Robinson, comes out of nowhere with the torn Achilles, yeah. and apparently he's 100% right now. Completely missed Pup. That kind of was a pretty huge signal for us. Yeah. you know. But he still could miss a couple of weeks. But now it's like, nah, he's good to go. What does that split look like? I have no idea. I don't yeah. think I want any part of it. I feel like you need to flex Etienne, Etienne at this point where you drafted him. I feel like you don't really yeah. – I mean, like, gosh, man, am I about to say this out loud? But, like, is there a Mike Davis versus Travis Etienne week, week one debate? And, like, what <laughs> odds of that would be? Uh, the debate is definitely there. I yeah. lean Etienne there. So, so but, I'm just saying. I'm just. But saying. it, I think it's like it's. I think it it's going to end up a lot closer than people realize. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. It's a bit that one's that one's a bit hot, but hopefully the listeners here know what we're saying is that we have low expectations for Etienne and high expectations for Mike Davis. Um, but the the, the pass catchers are, are really what I'm monitoring here. Um, because I, I think Kirk's the guy. I think Kirk's been a bit Christian Kirk's been a bit under he's not undervalued last year. And Agreed. you know, he got a huge contract, and I think he's a bit undervalued again, kind of an unsexy fantasy option, but a guy that you probably are starting every single week. But what emerges beyond that? I, I believe the Jags and, and T Law, they have the ability to support a couple pass catchers here. I don't think they're as bad as they you know showed that they were right. last year considering the circumstances. But you know, is that Zay Jones? Is Jay Zay Jones, you know, kind of distance himself as that second pass catcher? Is it Evan Ingram? You know, he, he's been he's been disappointing for a while, but tough to to knock his rookie season, tough to knock his, you know, some of the volume that he's seen, the athlete that he is. And then Marvin Jones maybe has another season left in the tank. But one thing I think is overlooked with Marvin Jones is like he, he's the only guy here that has literally a year under his belt with T-Law. There is yeah. some rapport built with Marvin Jones. So I think there's just a lot to question around this like next pass catcher behind Christian Kirk, um, because I really believe that individual, whether it be Zay Jones, Ingram or Marvin Jones, can be a fantasy contributor going forward. I agree with you there. I think it's telling that they moved on from Visca and are confident in the wide receiver room that they have there. They obviously brought in a lot of wide receivers. I'm known as 
a Christian Kirk. I'm a, I'm a well-known Christian Kirk guy. I, I like the talent. I think he's you know going to surprise a lot of people this year. But there is a lot of interesting situations that could go on about certain pass catchers. It could be like, I almost feel like it could end up being like Saints of old where you never really knew who to start amongst the pass catchers. And I wouldn't be shocked if we have something like that where like Dan Arnold has a week here and there. This week's going to be Zay Jones week. And then the next week, Christian Kirk's going to drop 40 on somebody. You know, it's going to be all over the place, which I love. But I think week one will be telling about who who has cemented themselves into having semi-decent roles. Giants at the Titans. Titans, Jake. Uh, Derrick Henry is going to probably run for about 240 yards. Um, that's a little bit of hyperbole, but obviously Derrick Henry is your first round pick in most situations. He's going right into the lineup. But what I'm most interested to see is Traylon Burks. Traylon Burks, depending on the depth chart that you look at from different places, he's the wide receiver one, he's the wide receiver two, he's the wide receiver three. I'm, I, I love Robert Woods, but Robert Woods is 30 years old coming off of an ACL injury. They've talked about, there's been stories that have come out about Traylon Burks. The only reason he played as much as he did in the preseason was basically to get some catch up work done from the asthma issues that he had in the, you know, in, in mini camp and whatnot. Burks's usage is going to be the most telling of how the season is going to play out amongst the wide receivers for me. Cause if they are using him, how I think they should, he's going to have a lot of design touches. He could, you know, he's going to probably be near 10 to 12 touches and targets combined. You know, I, I think there's a lot of upside there, and I, I really want to see how they use Burks this week more than anybody else. Yeah, I've been ridiculously high on Burks in redraft. I mean, I think I have him like right outside my top 30. You can usually get him in like the 50s, even 60s. I think he was yeah. like in like the ninth or tenth round on Yahoo the other day. I was like, okay, welcome to the team. Um, because the upside's there. It's a kind of it's kind of profile, it's a kind of draft capital that you want to bet on that late. So absolutely with you. Really interested to see how that shakes out. Giants. It's kind of a cop out to keep talking about ambiguous wide receiver groups, but I think the Giants is probably the biggest of all of them. Between Galladay, Tony, who's been banged up, who I think we could agree Tony would be our preferred number one wide receiver there, mm -hmm. but he's banged up. And then Wandale and now Shepard, Sterling Shepard, is back and he's in the mix. Like another Achilles injury coming back. Like it's a lot of guys are coming back from Achilles. We'll see how good they are, but. We know when Shepard's out on the field that DJ Jones peppers the shit out of him. He yeah. gets a lot of targets. Yeah. So, you know, I, I am, I'm only starting Tony, like, confidently in this one if he's healthy. Um, but I'm really keeping a close eye on Wondell and Shepard. You know, if, if Wondell or Shepard dropped, like, a 7 for 80 and one touchdown line, that would not surprise me. You know, yeah. now that I say that out loud, Shepard might have the best chance of doing that. But again, just something to monitor as uh, I've been a bit bullish on this Giants offense, not in terms of being elite or even very good, just mispriced in terms of ADP yeah. all offseason that there's been a lot of shots you could take on this Giants offense. And I think more, more times than not, those shots might pay off because you really just did not have to give much up to get these pieces. If there's anybody who I think can scheme players open in the NFL, it's it's Brian Dabble. You know, he, he's definitely up there as one of the guys. His systems previously have been very heavy on usage of the slot wide receivers. So I think whoever's playing out of the slot is going to have a, a very big role. And I don't think it's that hard to outproduce Kenny Galladay at this point in his career. I don't think many people would argue me on that. Um, and, and there's a lot of guys there that are, are super interesting, like you said. So I agree with your analysis, though. Tony's probably the only one I'm confidently starting, but a lot to look forward to there. Yeah, and we talk about getting ahead of the waiver wire, right? And I, and I think that like for some reason you're rostering, if you're in a one QB league and you're rostering a second quarterback or you're rostering a second tight end, you know, I think most times you want to pick up like a backup running back. But if you're a little weak at wide receiver, I think picking up Shepard or Wondell Robinson and sticking them on your bench to see how they perform in week one, you know, could turn into a situation where you, you save yourself, you know, five, 10, maybe 15% of your waiver wire funds by sticking one of these two wide receivers on the bench that, you know, might have a serious role on this Giants offense. I agree. Chiefs at the Cardinals should be an absolute barred burner here. Sporting a 54 point over under 4 p.m. game. You absolutely love to see it. You got the cards, my friend. I think the sneakiest option out of the Cardinals offense, obviously, James Conner had a great ADP. People are firing him up. Hollywood had a great ADP. You're firing him up. We don't know what the tight end room looks like. Is Zach Ertz going to play? Is he limited? Is he, you know, is he splitting snaps? I think AJ Green kind of wiggles himself into a flex option this week, though. He he had a pretty decent role last year, all things considered. Overall, had had a pretty solid year for for what his role was. But I think he's going to play more of that big outside role that we saw out of uh, DeAndre Hopkins whenever he was healthy. And, and so I think AJ Green ends up kind of being a sneaky flex play this week, outside of the the more obvious options in that high powered offense. All, all team dust. Mike Davis, AJ Green, Marvin honestly, Jones. Here we honestly, go. Honestly, <laughs> though, it, it, but it's 
it's it's crazy that we're talking about it, but if anybody's going to randomly pop off, it's during week one. That's when these veterans who their have teams been are there. Yeah, they've, they've been there. Their teams are picking them up, plugging them into the offense. Plus, I mean, especially with AJ Green, it's not like, yes, he's he's kind of dust at this point in his career. He had a 17% target share last year. That's not anything to bat an eye at, especially in that offense. He had 92 targets, you know, 848 receiving yards. Like, there's still something there. And I think week one is the week that something's going to happen, especially with D-Hop missing time, especially if Ertz misses time. Hollywood can't catch everything as much as I'd love him to based on my rostering of him this year. Chiefs, you know, what do the Chiefs do beyond Kelsey? A lot of points are going to be scored here, particularly by the Chiefs. I mean, 28 to 30 is almost an expectation at this point. Um, the offense is still elite. The Chiefs O-line is top tier. I don't think as many people are talking about that, but the Chiefs offensive line is insane. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I had a good offensive line giving Mahomes time. I think the Cardinals, at least last year, tended to blitz a lot, which could leave some space for Mahomes to operate and to exploit this offense. You know, I think the passing game, you know, really takes off here. I mean, it's got to with the implied point total, and I expect the Cardinals to be able to score pretty well against this Chiefs defense. So, you know, I look at the pieces, and, you know, I, I like Juju. I, I think that the, the ADP, in a sense, is, like, really settled on, you know, how we're going to be handling this offense. Like, Kelsey's obviously a smash. Juju's probably going to find himself in the top 30, top 25. Um, you know, CEH, RB3, fantasy viable. Um, but this is a game, and, and this came to me, and, and this comes from nothing analytically than just my gut. So mind you. But the gut has sometimes been good. But my deeper player is MVS. He's catching a deep one, starting this thing off with a hoot. Like with a hoot absolutely. Yeah. You know, is probably going to get like a 50, 60-yard touchdown. I'm here for it. I'm not saying MVS is my deeper call. If you're in a 10-team league, yeah, you're probably not starting MVS this yeah. week. But if you're in a 12-team league, you know, with like 10-plus starting roster spots, 14-team league, you need a little bit of a bump, maybe find yourself behind on Thursday Night Football. Um, you know, one of my bolder calls of the show, I think, will be that uh, MVS has himself a real fantasy week. Um, people are going to pounce on him. That's going to be a mistake because you can't trust him. But th this is the week that it happens. Yeah. I, I agree. I, it would not shock me if he had a line of like 281-1. At, at the end of the game like if he if he just catches a bomb takes it in gets one other target or one other reception you know it, that wouldn't shock anybody but that would be kind of your contrarian play where if you need something like you could do you could definitely do worse than plugging a chief's wide receiver into your offense this week anytime a chief's wide receiver that's on the field getting snaps it's always a good time yeah raiders versus the chargers what profiles to be yet another Offense heavy matchup chargers. What do you got for me? So the only team that was consistently as bad as both the chargers and Eagles last year against the tight end was the Raiders. So Gerald Everett, as I alluded to earlier, is one of my preferred streaming tight ends, especially for week one. The upside is there. They clearly use the tight, the, their tight ends in the red zone. You know, Josh Palmer maybe sneaks again if you're in a really deep league and are kind of just looking for something different. But but Gerald Everett, I have a lot of confidence plugging him in there. He's been pretty solid. He was basically Dawson Knox without the touchdowns last year. If you like Knox last year, you, I think you have to like Everett this year. So I'm plugging him and in, 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 in as a streaming tight end pretty confidently this week. Tyler, you, uh, we can't hear you. Thank you. I told you, I'm a little rusty. Won't happen again. I was muted. Many people are pegging the Raiders' offense to be an explosive in 2022. Um, be very explosive. So, you know, with this addition of DA, Carr apparently is going to take a step forward. Um, you know, there's a really strong shower narrative with Carr and DA. I mean, these guys play college ball together. I mm -hmm. think I just read like last week, Jake, that they almost died together on a whitewater yeah. rafting trip, if that's real. <laughs> you did. They, that did very much happen. The bond of DA and Carr is strong. So we're expecting to see a lot of really great things happen for this past offense. I mean, Waller, Renfro's good. Um, but what actually happens, right? I think the Raiders' offensive line is bad and profiles to be much much better run blocking uh, than a pass blocking unit. You know, Chargers were run funnel last year. I'm not really too – I mean, they got better, but I'm not sure if it's that much better. I think the, the Raiders choose to run the ball as long as they humanly possible. Remember, Mike McDaniels um, is the coach here now from Patriots who also love to run the ball. You know, what does this committee look like behind Jacobs is a question that I'm, I keep asking myself. You know, is it is – 
rookie Zamir White? Is it Abdullah? Is this like, is there a combination of Jacobs and Zamir White and Abdullah that could look almost like a Damian Harris or Mondre from mm-hmm. last year at the Patriots? Um, it's a better offense on the Raiders, but you know, I, I would expect with Devontae Adams and the fact that they're in the division they're in that they don't run as much, but still, um, you know, I think there could be, you know, Zamir White breakout or Abdullah where like, oh, wait, one of these guys is going to be relevant because this is a bit of a committee. People have been saying it all offseason. It's worth monitoring. I digress. Yeah, I agree. There, there's a lot of question marks in how that breaks down. Do we see it just like a Patriots offense of, of old where we have a James White role? We have, you know, your kind of early down bruiser role and, and Jacobs there. It'll be interesting to see, though. Packers at Vikings. Hit me with the Vikings take. I think I'm pretty confident starting just about anybody besides Irv Smith. I, I am a noted Irv Smith disliker. Uh, I just don't think he he fits the offense as well as everybody thinks he does. Does he play that Tyler Higby role? Maybe. But I think that Tyler Higby role historically has been more of a you put him in there and you hope you get lucky with a touchdown there. There's just too much talent in that offense, I think, for him to really shine. You know, obviously, Adam Thielen's back healthy. He's been a red zone, you know, God, for lack of a better term, over the past few years. Justin Jefferson is your wide receiver one, two, or three, if you're one of those weirdos who likes chase over him. Um, you know, he's a top wide receiver. He's getting plugged in there pretty well. KJ Osborne quietly working his way into flex conversation there as well, too. But, you know, I, and Dalvin Cook is Dalvin Cook. So, I mean, I'm confident in just about anybody, but if Irv Smith is my tight end, I may be looking and seeing if Everett is on my waiver wire as a streaming option over him this week. Packers side of the ball. I think Lazard's health is that right? Is up in up in the air. Have we heard one way or another? He got stepped on. Uh, I think it's an ankle. Um, if I if I read it correctly, so he's he's definitely got some questions. Yeah. So if if he doesn't play, right? I guess like it's two things. It's like one, they're probably going to run the ball a lot. Why wouldn't he get AJ Dillon and Aaron Jones? They're pe- the best two players on the field. Right. A uh, best two skill players on the field, obviously, besides Aaron Rodgers. But there's got to be some – it's Aaron Rodgers' offense. Like, there's got to be something there in, in the pass game that is going to be relevant, even if he spreads it out. It's kind of like what we talk about with Mahomes. It's just like yeah. there's got to be points there somewhere because we know that the quarterback is that good. We know the offense can be that good. Um, outside of Lazard, and especially if Lazard, Lazard sits, add him to the all-dust team. I think Randall Cobb has actual shot at being relevant. Um, it sounds silly, right? I'm like, oh, Randall Cobb, we're like, dude, dude old. dude's old. He sucked for years. Yeah. What are we thinking? But it's like – I'm not sure he's startable, but I think he's worth monitoring at the very least because I'm not putting my chips in on dubs and I, or dubs. I mean, I haven't done that at all, all season no. long. Um, Christian Watson, especially not him. He's been out for pretty much the entire summer. It's like right. Amari Rogers, like, no, thank you. I just think that, like, we need to at least be monitoring who the second wide receiver is. I think it could be Cobb. If Lazard sits, Cobb gets a little bit more interesting for me. Um I think this game also has a good chance to go over. It's, I think it was 47 over under mm-hmm. last time I checked, especially the Vikings score like two touchdowns or 17 points in the first half. This has a good chance of turning a little bit more of a shootout than I think people are willing to admit. And I think you can add to the all dust team there with saying that like Sammy Watkins could come out of nowhere and I do forgot Sam- Sammy Watkins and, and, do, and do the Sammy Watkins week one randomness that he kind of does seemingly every year. But uh, I agree. It's just it's. Uh, I hate ambiguous wide receiver rooms almost more than I hate ambiguous running, you know, running back rooms. It's just who, who is the guy there? And we don't really know, but I, you telling me Randall Cobb at 31 or however 32, I think this year can't just find a, a gap in his own and sit in it and pray that Aaron looks his way. Yeah. I think you'd uh, do worse. Yeah. I'm with you. All dust team. It's what we got going on here. Bucks, Cowboys, Cowboys are a little beat up, but do they have what it takes? Jake. I think they do. I think last year, you know, we saw them really open up their playbook against Tampa, do some more interesting things here. I think you just stick with your guys here, though. I think this is a we're starting CD. We're starting Dak. We're starting Schultz. I think past that, I think you get you're trying to get too fancy. Zeke, I feel like isn't going to have the game. We all hope he does. I feel like he's going to end up blocking more than anything else because that offensive line is hurt. That wide receiver room is not great. There's a lot of just, again, a lot of questions, a lot of injuries really impacting the Cowboys, especially early on. This is a Buccaneers team as well that is 
they were one of the three best teams against running backs last year. Like there's just no confidence in me in the room. I think the most interesting piece though, what I'm looking out for the most kind of what I'm monitoring is Tony Pollard actually getting a role in the slot. Mm -hmm. I think if he's getting a role in the slot, he becomes almost like a must start if you're rostering him just because if he's really getting like six or seven targets out of the slot, he's probably going to get a few carries here and there as well. If he's still returning anything, he's got always got the chance to take one of those to the house too. So Pollard's definitely the most interesting piece for me here, but I'm not necessarily getting fancy enough to start him week one. Bucks. A lot of this hinges on Godwin's health. I haven't heard one way or another. I'm leaning towards him sitting. Same. Um, but I think Julio's a decent play this week. Uh, becomes a good play if Godwin sits. All dust. Uh, all dust. Yeah, all, I, dust. all dust. All dust, team. we got to tweet it out. Um, I'm firmly Julio over Gage. Uh, from here on, just moving forward, as long as Julio's on the field. Yep. Also, watching to see you know if Fournette also has the same stranglehold of this backfield on touches as he did last year. The expectation, obviously, with his ADP is that he does, but also, you're going to love this, Jake. They did not have Rashad White in the backfield last year either. Um, who, by the way, Rashad White should also not be on anyone's waiver wire that's listed. Yes. Go to your waiver wire, Rashad White's there, get him on your bench. Um, but yeah, that's my take there is basically like, pick up Rashad White. I like Julio if Godwin sits. Yeah, for I Godwin was still in a non-contact jersey as of the most recent reports that I saw. I'm not confident firing him up week one, even if he is healthy. It seems a lot like who is it? Was it Keenan Allen last year who like basically came in for the first play, was healthy, had one reception? Like it's it's seeming a lot like that situation, or maybe that was two years ago, and my brain is still you know catching there. up from the I'm off season. You. But, I'm trusting you, but yeah, so it's. You know, it, it's one of those situations where health doesn't really mean a whole lot to me. I'll, I'll stick with our all dust call here, though. And I'm if I have Julio somewhere, he's probably in my lineup. Monday night football, final one of the pot. Broncos at Seattle, almost poetic for Russell Wilson to go back home and absolutely destroy his former yeah. Seattle Seahawks. You got Seattle. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, like if you have DK, you're probably starting him, but I'm really avoiding everyone else there. Like I look, Rashad Penny had a great end of the year last year. I don't think there's any denying that whatsoever. He was also consistently playing like bottom eight, bottom 10 run defenses during that stretch last year. I'm not saying the Broncos defense is superstars against the running backs by any means, but they're above league average against them. And this offense with Geno Smith at the helm just isn't super awe-inspiring. But DK was mostly fine last year with Geno. So I'm fine starting him. Tyler Lockett, again, a flex play at best, kind of in that deep flex territory where it's like, if my choice is, again, if my choice is Julio or Lockett, I'm, I'm starting Julio. If my choice is Randall Cobb or Lockett, that one starts to get a little more interesting. But I, I might even side with you here and start Mike Davis in the flex over Tyler Lockett this week, which is, it feels crazy to say that. But that, I mean, that's where we're at if Geno Smith is the starting quarterback. Broncos, it's, I don't have a good take here. It's Hamler or Albert O. We're kind of watching to see who that third target is. It, is Sutton or Judy the guy? Victory laps of plenty uh, after this game. I, I'm almost certain. Same with, is, is it going to be, you know, an even split? Or yep. do we see like a 65, 35 Melgo, Javante? A lot to see here as we see a brand new Russell Wilson led offense. The snap distribution, target distribution, just something to keep an eye on. Most of these guys are likely rostered, maybe not Hamler. Um, but the Broncos should roll either way. Um, I think the the course that would be the easiest would obviously be to run all over the Seahawks. But the idea of Russell Wilson dropping 300 yards and four touchdowns against his former team at home does sound pretty good, though. Especially after that story just came out at ESPN about how they would like take their foot off the gas. They wouldn't let him throw in the second half of games when they had a lead. I think it's just too perfect of a situation for us to not walk in and go for, like you said, like 304. That's week one, folks. Crushing the competition. Before we get out of here, Jake, plug the Twitter, plug the work, my friend. Yes, my Twitter is at Perry underscore FF. You can see all of my content through both my Twitter, the JWB Fantasy Football Twitter and website and YouTube page as well. So make sure you like and subscribe to that if you aren't already. And then my own personal podcast, Two Average Husbands, is available on most streaming platforms as well as YouTube and on Twitter as well. So make sure you check all that out. We appreciate all the love and support that you guys give us. And you can find me, Tyler, on Twitter, at F Tyler O. FF Tyler O. Two Fs, not one. That's all we have today, folks. Don't forget, tell somebody you love them. Later. Later.